Would you take your Bible and turn with me today to 1 John, the fifth chapter, 1 John chapter 5. One day a salesman was traveling through the backwoods in the country and he realized he was lost. He saw a little boy sitting by the side of the road under a big oak tree and the man said, uh, son, how far am I from Charlotte? The little boy shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know. And the man said, well, son, can you tell me how to get out to the main road from here? The little boy shrugged his shoulders again and said, I don't know. So the man looked at him again and said, boy, let me ask you, do you know where you are? Where are we? He shrugged his shoulder again. He said, I don't know. The man started to get a little bit irritated with him, and he said, boy, you don't know much, do you? The little boy looked at the man. He said, mister, I know I ain't lost. <laughs> now, that's bad English, but it's good theology. And I want to ask you that question today. Do you know that you're not lost? How can we know that we're saved? Some people say today the word saved is outdated, but let me tell you something. The word saved is a Bible word. Scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. It's not an outdated word. What does the word save mean? It means that you've repented from your sin. It means that you've opened your heart to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. He's forgiven you. He lives in your heart and life, and you're going to heaven when you die. That's what the word save means. That's a Bible word. That's a precious word. That's not an outdated word. Can you say amen? Well, let's look at what God tells us today about how to know that we are saved. 1 John chapter 5, as we stand together, we're going to begin here in verse 10. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. Now, go back to verse 13. We're going to key in here. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Father, may your Holy Spirit take your word today and place it deep within our hearts and if there are those here this morning without Jesus, may this be the day they would be saved. And if there are those who are doubting and uncertain and unsure, may this be the day that they will know that they are saved. And we thank you that you make that possible. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated and keep your Bible open before you. The Bible tells us very clearly it is possible to be saved and know it. However, it is also possible to be saved and doubt it. And so many believers doubt their salvation and then they think, well, if I doubt my salvation, then I must not be saved. But if you doubt your salvation once in a while, it may just mean that you care enough about your soul to be concerned. 
For you see, the truth is we only doubt what we tend to believe. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not encouraging you to doubt this morning. I'm just trying to show you that doubt is to your spirit what pain is to your body. When you have a pain, it doesn't mean that you're already dead. It just means that something may be wrong and you need to get it checked out. And doubt is like that. Doubt is a spiritual sign, a signal that something is wrong. And we need to have a spiritual checkup. One woman told the great evangelist D.L. Moody that she had never had a single doubt about her salvation. And you know what Moody said? He said, Madam, I doubt that you have ever been saved. I thought that was interesting. That's like somebody saying, we've been married for 50 years, and we've never had a crossword or an argument. Now, when somebody tells me that, I know one of two things. Either they're lying, or they don't talk very much. <laughs> but doubt is not always bad, because sometimes doubt points to a problem in our lives that we need to deal with. But if we constantly doubt our salvation... We will seldom make an impact for Christ because we spend all of our time filled with anxiety, worrying about whether or not we're truly saved. And maybe someone here this morning is dealing with that doubt. Maybe you wonder deep inside, are you really saved? And 1 John tells us how to determine that we are, how to know that we are saved. I want you to turn back to 1 John chapter 2. And look at one of the things we're going to look at today here in chapter 2. Notice with me verse 3 and verse 4. Now by this we know that we know him. So he's saying here's how you know you can know that you're saved. By this we know that we know him if we keep the commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep the commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, how many of you have kept every commandment of God every day of your life and never broken a single commandment? Anybody? I don't see any hands. I don't anticipate there's any hands in the Christian Life Center either because Jesus Christ is the only perfect person that ever lived. And I'm sure glad you didn't raise your hand because I've got some verses that would really humble you if you did. <laughs> but I want you to look at something here in 1 John chapter 1. And we see here something very significant down in verse 8. Again, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's a good place to say amen. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So then what does this mean? If we are unable to keep all the commandments, does it mean that we're lost? Not at all. You see, the word keep there is the key, and in the original language of Scripture, that word keep is translated from a word which was a sailor's term or a mariner's term, and the sailors would steer by the stars. So John is saying that we steer our life by the commandments. Now, sometimes the sailors would miss their mark, or they would oversteer, or they would be blown off course or they would fall asleep on duty. But the aim or the goal of the sailor was to steer by the stars. And our aim, our goal as Christians is to live by the commandments of God, to steer our lives by the commandments. And so if a person is saved, then they're going to want to do that. They're going to want to live by the commandments of God. They're not going to perfectly keep the commandments, but they're going to steer their life by the commandments of God. And remember now, we are not saved by keeping God's commandments. We keep His commandments because we are saved. God knew that we couldn't keep the commandments when He gave them to Moses. Then why did God give them? 
God gave us the commandments to show us what He already knew, that we can't keep them, that we fall short of keeping His commandments, and we need a Savior whose name is Jesus. And God wanted us to understand that, so He gave us the commandments to show us how to live, but also to show us we fall short because we can't keep them. And because of that, we need a Savior. But if we are truly saved, now mark this in your mind and in your heart. If we are genuinely saved, it will grieve us when we sin. If you can sin and sin and sin and it never bothers you, that is an indication that you're lost. When a saved man or a saved woman sins, it's going to bother them. It's going to grieve their spirit. So we see here the commandment test. We have to understand the teaching of John as it relates to the commandment. Are we steering our life by the commandments? And then turn back to 1 John chapter 4, and we see something else. 1 John 4 and, and verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Now, that's pretty clear. Have you ever had a difficult time loving your brothers and sisters? You say, sure, we all do that. We all struggle with that from time to time. Now, it doesn't say here you have to agree with them all the time, but it does say you have to love them. You see, God probably doesn't like what I do all the time, but God loves me. And sometimes we don't like what each other's will do, but we love each other because we're Christians, brothers and sisters related in Christ. Have you ever heard people say, you don't have to go to church to worship God? You ever had anybody say that? Well, that's true. But have you ever had anybody to say, you can worship God just as good without going to church? That's not true. That's false. Hebrews 10, 25 says that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You see, what God is saying to us here, he's talking here about the companion test, and he's saying that if we are saved, we're going to love the church. Why? Because we possess the nature of God, and God loves the church. And you would say, well, yes, I love the church, but what is the church? Well, the Bible says the church is the body of Christ. In fact, I want you to turn for a minute back to Colossians chapter 1. Keep your place here in John, but turn back over to Colossians, the first chapter. And there's a verse here that I want you to see. And it talks to us about the church. And in Colossians 1, 18, look and listen to what Scripture says. It says, and he, speaking of Jesus, is the head of the body the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. You see, Jesus is the head of the church. The pastor is not the head of the church. The deacons are not the head of the church. The members are not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. Amen? And so Jesus wants us to understand that the church is a body. And through the years, I've had people say, Jesus, yes, but the church, no. And anytime I hear that, I, I chuckle because it's absolutely ridiculous. Jesus is the head of the church. And that would be like a bridegroom at a wedding saying, I'll love her head, but I won't love her body. It's just absolutely ridiculous. You can't do that. For a person to say, I love Jesus, but I do not love the church is foolishness. Because Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus and the church are inseparable. You cannot love the head without loving the body. And if that's what you're doing, then Scripture says you're lost. That a, a, a saved person won't do that. And the church is not only the body of Christ, but the church is the bride of Christ. Now think about this. One of the ways that somebody can get your attention is to abuse your body. They get your attention. Years ago, one day, I was trying to build a little building. 
and I had a guy helping me. I didn't know anything about what I was trying to do, and he knew less than I did. And so I picked up a hammer, and I handed it to him, and that was my first mistake. And I said, I'm going to hold this board, and you nail it to this other board, and we'll see how that looks. He said, all right, I'll do that. And he took that hammer, and what did he do? He missed that nail and hit me right square on the thumb. Hard. Now, I didn't curse. I'll be honest with you, though, I wanted to write it down and sign my name to it. Because <laughs> it hurt. But now, what would I have done if he would have looked at me and said, well, I didn't hit your thumb, I just hit your body. Now, if he said that, I'd have took that hammer and hit him in the head with it. That's, that's what I would have done because my thumb is part of my body. But when we say, I love Jesus, but not the church, then we're saying the very same thing. When you abuse the body, when you abuse the body, you get the attention of the head. When you don't love his church, you get his attention. If you understand me, say amen. And then there's another way you can get a man's attention, particularly if you abuse his bride. I love my wife. And if you say anything about her, you have to deal with me. And everybody ought to feel that way. Every man worth his salt will feel that way. And that's how Jesus feels about the church. The church is his body and the church is his bride. And if you abuse his body and you abuse his bride, you're going to have him to deal with. And so this is a way that we can know that we are saved. Do we love the head? Do we love the body? That's an indication of a saved man because God loves the church. And then turn to 1 John chapter 5 once again. And let's look at something else in this fifth chapter. And this could be called the belief test, but it really is more than that. It, it, means, it means commitment. If you go back to our text in verse 10, he who believes in the Son of God has witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. Now, the English word believe is not forceful enough to really communicate what Scripture is saying here in its original language, I can say to you, I believe Abe Lincoln was president of the United States, but I don't put my trust in Abe Lincoln. You see, the word, the Bible word, believe, means commitment. It means commitment. And the New Testament salvation is much more, and I want you to listen to me, it's much more than an intellectual belief. It's much more than walking a church aisle and shaking a preacher's hand and giving intellectual assent to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It is a commitment that we make to the Lord Jesus Christ that we give ourselves totally and wholly to Him, that we turn from our sin, that we give our life to Christ, and that we live for Christ for the remainder of our lives. And that's biblical salvation. It requires commitment. And I want you to notice here the word believe. It's in the present tense. If you've ever gone out and talked to many people about their souls and occasionally you'll run into somebody who has not darkened the door of the church in ages and for all practical purposes they're living for the devil. And if you invite them to the church it's like talking to a concrete slab and, and they'll usually say something like this, oh I got saved back when I was nine years old at No Hope Baptist Church, and they hadn't been to church in years. That's not salvation. What they did was give intellectual assent to the gospel. But if they do not love the church, and they are not committed to Christ and His church, they have been deceived, they have not been saved, because you can't love Christ without loving His bride, the church. You understand? Amen? So salvation includes Commitment. It means commitment. First John 10 speaks about a new salvation, a right now salvation. Salvation is not some 30-second experience you get over. 
Some people can pinpoint the very moment they were saved. Other people cannot. But the best proof that you are saved is right where you are this moment. Are you at this moment trusting Jesus Christ to save you? There's a commandment test. Do we long to live a holy life, to live by the commandments? Does it grieve our heart when we sin? Then there's the companion test. Do we love the body of Christ? Do we love the bride of Christ? And there's the commitment test. Have we really committed our life to Jesus by the life that we live? So how do you fare today? How do you stack up in your own heart and your own life when you look at these three things that the Bible teaches us about salvation? How do you know that you are saved? If Jesus sat down with you and opened the book of 1 John and went through these verses of Scripture with you today, could you sincerely say to him, I know that I'm saved, and all three of these areas of my life bear witness to the fact that I have given my life to Jesus? Or is there in your heart at this moment some degree of doubt as to whether or not when you die you will go to heaven? Listen, you don't have to doubt that anymore. The Bible says these things have been written that you may know that you have eternal life. And so in a moment, we're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation, a song of invitation. And the invitation is very simple. If there is a question mark in your heart about your salvation, you can get it settled today. That's why God has you here. And our pastors will be in both services to talk to you, and we invite you to come forward and get the question of your salvation settled this very day so that you can know that you know that you are saved. Let's stand together and you come as we sing.